Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters in Christ, friends all. My thanks to the Order of Malta for inviting me to address a topic of vital importance to the Australian community. The campaign to redefine marriage has recently gained such momentum with now three and soon four bills before the Commonwealth Parliament that many think it's inevitable. This can leave those with misgivings feeling that they are already losers in a done deal. Some think it's the inexorable progress of liberty and equality, which leaves the doubters on the wrong side of history. In this context, supporters of classical marriage are presumed to have no real arguments to offer. So tonight I want to offer some reasons, not decrees from on high or from the distant past, not expressions of hatred or prejudice, but reasons I hope anyone can understand. I also hope you find these reasons persuasive and helpful in proclaiming and witnessing to true marriage amongst your relatives, friends and colleagues. But even if you disagree with me at the end of the day on this matter, I hope tonight's talk will help you understand why Australian law has always held And many people still hold that marriage is for people of opposite sex. I want to explore five views on this matter. That it's all about justice. That sexual differences don't matter. That it's all about love. That it's all about the numbers and that it doesn't affect me. Along the way, I'll be offering some reasons for preserving the classical understanding of marriage. Recently, Sydney Morning Herald journalist Michael Kozoi wrote that all opposition to same-sex marriage stems from hatred, pure and simple. But if that were true, then all the recent high-profile converts to same-sex marriage were previously homophobes or liars, including Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Penny Wong and others. If they weren't in fact bigots when they previously thought marriage was for a man and a woman, then it shouldn't be presumed that those who now hold that view are bigots either. In reality, of course, we all know and love someone with same-sex attraction. We recognise that people of the same sex can love each other, sometimes deeply, that they express this in ways that seem similar to the ways married men and women express their love and that some people want to commit to this in a public ceremony. They are usually good-willed people who feel they are missing out on something precious. Because we want the best for them, we feel the tug of the view that everything that makes opposite sex couples happy should be open to them too. We want no more of the discriminatory or violent treatment that such people suffered in the past and sometimes still do. No more of the depression, self-hatred and self-harm either. After all, God made every person unique and irreplaceable as his beloved images in this world. And if God loves people with same-sex attraction, so must the church. 
The Catechism of the Catholic Church and the recent Bishop's pastoral letter, Don't Mess With Marriage, teach that every human being, regardless of race, religion, age, sex or sexual orientation, deserves our reverence. That all forms of unjust discrimination must be opposed. That everyone is entitled to justice and compassion. And that the challenges of healthy and chaste friendships are for every human being, whatever their attractions. If Christians haven't always talked that way, or always walked their talk, we should repent and do better in the future. But when it comes to what the law is or should be, not all differential treatment is necessarily unjust. Women's hospitals are closed to men. Programs for Indigenous Australians are targeted to them. Primary schools enrol only children. These different treatments aren't discriminatory because the differences upon which they are based are reasonable ones. Women, children and Aborigines merit particular assistance. So if our marriage laws recognise and support man and woman unions for good reasons, that will not necessarily be unjust to other kinds of friendships. Under any marriage law, some relationships won't be recognised as marriages. Sibling cohabitators, for instance, thruples, etc. But unless we know what marriage is, we can't judge whether this restriction treats all citizens justly. To put it another way, we all support marriage equality, treating all real marriages equally. The question is, what is a real marriage? Until recently, the answer to that question was obvious. Every serious culture, religion, philosophy and legal system in the world understood marriage as the union of a man and a woman to the exclusion of all others voluntarily entered into for life. So it is that a man and a woman undertake not merely to live together but to have and to hold as husband and wife. That is, to do what husbands and wives do, including engaging in acts of lovemaking that are potentially life-making. But if marriage is a natural institution of that kind that pre-exists church and state, why should governments get involved at all? For one reason only. Because the marital acts that bring children into the world also seal and express the marital unions that provide for the long-term nurture of those children. Marriage binds those whose lovemaking was life-making, both to each other as husband and wife and to those children as mother and father. The benefits to children of having the contributions of both a mum and a dad committed to each other and to them over the long haul are well established in human experience and social science research. In that sense, Marriage is the best department of population, health, education, welfare and crime prevention we've ever come up with. Other friendships may do other good things and be worthy of support, but only marriage unites a man and a woman and directs their complementary sexual reproductive natures 
the having and rearing of children. And that is why, uniquely of all human relationships, states have an interest in their success. The Catholic Church, following the clear teaching of the Old Testament, of Christ Jesus and of the Apostle Paul, has always taught that marriage is that unique institution whereby a man leaves mother and father and cleaves to his wife so that the two become one flesh and so may be fruitful and multiply. Recent popes have explored the rich significance of our sexual differentiation as male and female and of marriage as a comprehensive bodily, emotional and spiritual union. One that brings and holds together people and values that otherwise have a tendency to fall apart. Men and women, sex and love, love making and life making, babies and parents. St John Paul II, for instance, elaborated a contemporary theology of the body in which the long tradition about sex being for marriage and marriage being for man and woman was shown to be rich in argument and profound in its implications. In his recent much praised encyclical letter on caring for the environment, Laudato Si, Pope Francis also suggests we must accept ourselves in our bodily being in our masculinity and femininity. Accept the Creator's gift specific to our own sex and to the opposite sex. Encounter someone different and find mutual enrichment in bringing those gifts together in marriage. The difference and complementarity of man and woman is the anthropological reality at the foundation of marriage and the family, he says. Marriage should not, he goes on, be sub the subject of endless manipulation according to passing ideological fads. Of course, this ancient wisdom that marriage is inherently opposite sex is not peculiar to Catholics. Christians share it with Jews and Muslims. The three great Abrahamic religions share it with the other world religions of the ancient world and since. The world religions share it with more local ones, for example, Australian Aboriginal and Pacific Islander religions. And religious traditions share it with most secular philosophies, legal systems and cultures. Though customs around marriage vary between cultures and over time, there's remarkable consistency about marriage uniting people of opposite but complementary sex. Any union that is intended to be faithful, to the exclusion of all others, potentially fruitful, to have and to hold each other as man and wife, and so be open to children. And final, till death do us part. Over the last few decades, there have been some very real advances in our appreciation of romance and intimacy in marriage. In respect for the dignity of women and children, in the sharing of lives and responsibilities between spouses and in the theology and pastoral care of marriages. Yet even as our understanding of relationships has been enriched in so many ways, modernity has found itself in a mess about marriage. In just a few decades, we've moved from a situation where almost everyone in the West got married and stayed married 
to one where most people of marriageable age are not married. They live singly or in a series of cohabiting relationships. One of those might in due course become a de facto marriage at law. At some point, perhaps when the couple are thinking of having children, they may decide to solemnise it. But if ye, after years of try before you buy and habitual non-commitment, many find they cannot sustain actual marriages once entered. Some try again and fail again. Many eschew childbearing altogether. Some want children, but in limited numbers later in life after achieving 